Hello, everyone. Hope everyone's having a, a good day. So I'm here to uh, talk about random vibration. Now, um, getting into random vibration, the main difference that we have here is that we are dealing with multiple frequencies that are acting upon our system simultaneously. Um, this is primarily done uh, because normally, um, if we're not dealing with just random oscillations or caring about any kind of responses, uh, most of the time we have a lot of random frequencies acting upon any kind of system or structure um, or device um, simultaneously. As this states, these are random. So the unique portion of uh, this system or this application is that it is more statistical um, of an analysis uh, than the other uh, analyses that we presented here. So many common applications um, or common processes rather um, that experience random vibration would include vehicles on a roadway. Uh, this would be either through like freight transportation or uh, any kind of devices or suspension of your vehicles and cars. Um, all of these need to go through random vibration uh, analysis. Airplanes during operation. This can either be through uh, either taxiing on the runway uh, during takeoff or even uh, in flight, right? Um, all of the loads and vibrations that the plane experiences through the devices, the, um, the engines, the turbines, uh, the wind resistance, it is all taken randomly uh, throughout the system. Uh, supports that hold multiple pieces of equipment. So for example, in this image, uh, we have large pieces of HVAC equipment being supported on a frame on top of a building. Uh, will that frame hold up to the operational conditions that these devices are exerting? How about the wind loads? How about um, if there's any kind of uh, random vibration from nearby equipment that may be completely separate of these? These need to be uh, examined. And of course, uh, rocket and spacecraft launches. Uh, large amounts of vibration uh, from, from all pieces uh, inside of our rocket needs to be um, and analyzed to make sure that everything is OK. So we can't talk about random vibration without going into power spectral density. And so power spectral density is a way in which we can take our random excitement or our random vibration, collect them into a series of frequency bins, and essentially display uh, the power density as a root mean square across our frequencies. Okay, uh, these power spectral densities, uh, as we said, come from our random input. Okay, so this random input can be provided by uh, shaker table, um, accelerometer, um, raw data. This is a deterministic method of getting um, our information or our random vibration. Now, as we transition to a power spectral density, we collect them into what we call or what we would want to calculate as effective bins. So in this instance, we have a 10, 30, 50, 70, and 90 hertz bin. And it's going to encompass, in this case, 0 to 20, 20 to 40, 40 to 60, 60 to 80, 80 to 100. Uh, these frequency bins uh, collect these random vibrations. Um, at these frequencies, we take the root mean square so that we can obtain the average value and create a power spectral density at each of these locations, as we see here. This because of the undeterministic value of random vibration becomes a very statistical analysis. It becomes also a lot quicker than just taking our acceleration data and putting it into a transient analysis to see how it would respond through our random vibration. So with that, um, we do have some restrictions. As with all of the other um, uh, analyses that we've seen today. Um, these are linear analyses and they need to it, this analysis needs to be linear in order to perform this PSD. This means the structure will not have uh, any kind of random properties or time dependent properties. Uh, the time varying stiffness, damping or mass 
um, will not be included. And any um, time varying boundary conditions are not going to be included. Okay, so for our random vibration, we actually need to load it using a modal analysis. And we can do that by um, one of two ways. Uh, we can drag and drop our random vibration separately and connect them individually along with our solution and drag and dropping on the setup. Or if you drag and drop random vibration directly onto the solution node of a modal, this will automatically connect everything you need. If you're interested in pre-stressing for a random vibration, so let's say uh, you have a device that need that is going to cause some kind of uh, pre-bend or pre-tension, uh, maybe a bolts from a pre-tension, this pre-stressing needs to be done before the modal and then fed into our modal as we see here. So we would pre-stress in our static structural, feed into our modal analysis, and then feed into our random vibration. Now, random vibration, as mentioned earlier, it is a statistical analysis, which means we are going to be dealing with, uh, we need to get a response from it um, and use the average response as our, um, as our solution. This average response is calculated from the root mean square of this uh, response PSD. And it is considered a standard deviation of the response due to the fact that the statistical analysis is on a Gaussian curve. As we see here, um, ANSYS will actually allow us to display and calculate for one times the root mean square or one sigma, which accounts for 68.27% of your total response, two times the root mean square or two sigma, which accounts for 95.45% of the total response, and three times root mean square or three sigma, which is 99.73% of our response. Okay, so from here, I'm going to bring in a quick example. And as we can see here, I have a trust, a, I would say a simple trust design that I've already applied a modal analysis to. We have our modal analysis here, and we can even examine the results from our modal. We can see that in our third mode shape, we could have a area of concern on one end, and in our fourth mode shape, we have an area of concern over here. And as Patrick, as Pat alluded to earlier, um, these mode shapes will help us help guide us in our random vibration to kind of examine and use the tools that random vibration um, has to analyze our system. So, in this case, we are going to apply this PSD acceleration to our analysis. Now, this is can be provided either through acceleration data and a calculation into a PSD was made, or it can become or it can come from any kind of standards um, that we may use. But this is our PSD here, and as you can see, it is connected with these three green lines, which in ANSYS means this is considered reliable data that it can use uh, easily. So for demonstrative purposes, I'm going to add something that would be a little um, little extreme at this point in time. And you can see in this case, this line between these two points is now yellow. OK, uh, ANSYS deems yellow as unreliable. However, um, potentially OK, whereas red is completely unreliable and you shouldn't use it. Luckily for us, there is a way that we can convert this yellow curve into a series of green curves. And what ANSYS will do is it will subdivide this, uh, this distance, the frequency and the PSD value into multiple uh, sub-locations sub so that we can have a more uh, accurate result. And in order to do that, we go into our details, go to load data, and under tabular data, if we hit this right arrow, 
there's this option for improved fit. And what it's going to do is anything that is considered yellow or red, ANSYS is going to try and improve the fit as you see here. So what it did is it subdivided the disk uh, from my 45 to my 60 to provide an extra three segments to give me uh, green lines between those two points. Uh, this is really, really useful uh, because sometimes the provided PSD or the provided information that we have calculated, while we have calculated and we know what it is true, may not fully fit inside um, the plots here inside of ANSYS. So we can then subdivide that distance and get an accurate plot here. Now, I know I used PSD acceleration uh, for this example, but we also have, if you right click on your, on your system, insert, we also have acceleration, we have velocity, we have G acceleration and displacement as options to use. So going from here, I'm going to open up my solve system here using the original settings that we had, that we were using, and, kind of, and go over um, options for our post-processing. So I've created a directional deformation post-process. And what this is going to do is it's going to provide a maximum directional deformation in the y-axis, as we see here, in our one sigma category. So statistically, this is telling me that this is the deformation on a contour location that we should experience with this random vibration from a one sigma probability. We can change that as I did here to two sigma and three sigma. And you will see this legend, our scale over here, will change for each of them as we see appropriately. So on top of that, if we did not want to contour, if we wanted to really see the response at a local point, so let's say we're placing a piece of equipment somewhere, let's say at the very end over here where we are obviously seeing an issue, we can add a response PSD tool by right clicking the solution, insert, and add a response PSD tool. The response PSD tool will only work for uh, vertex vertices or coordinate systems or remote points. Okay, it is a for a single point that you want to analyze. And in this instance, I've placed a vertex in the middle of of this location, center of the edge here, where we were seeing um, an issue. And I have selected a results type of acceleration along the y axis, which is vertical in that same orientation. And we can now get our response spectrum or our response PSD plot here. And you can see at what frequency, right, we have our highest response. From here, we can take this information and perform fatigue analysis. We can perform uh, this kind of, we can apply the response that we see here into um, the model of, let's say, whatever device we plan on mounting there. Um, and we can further move, um, move this down the line and kind of see how at a singular point our assembly is going to react. Right? And so from here, I'm going to hand it back over to Pat uh, to give some concluding concluding remarks.